What's up, everybody? Welcome back once again to this, the final installment of my Union Experience story set. <laughs> now, if you were, don't worry, I have lots and lots of stories to tell outside of this particular experience. But I wanted to finish this out um, by, well, sort of just sort of reiterating, highlighting once again what the sort of end game that this entire experience ultimately culminated in. Now, so far, we've discussed a little bit about the basics of organizing, the sort of nature of the professional activist. We've gone over the organizing conversations, and I've even talked a little bit about some of the odd campaign games I played, as well as oh, some of the odder, more spy gamey style shit that I had to do while with SEIU. Now, as I said in the last video, um, ultimately, when in Philly, what I discovered was that the workers that I was organizing, the efforts I was I was taking, the uh, the relationships that I was building, some of which I will say to this day um, were friendships, more than just a worker organizer relationship. I began to really like a lot of the people and even hang out with some of them um, when not doing the organizing thing. But what I discovered is that due to the sort of, um, well, shitty and shady operations that the union local 32BJ was known to engage in and was engaging in in Philly, I was booted off the campaign, sent back to New Hampshire where they knew they could fire me without issue. Now, this came about because once I discovered that the workers from the uh, U.S. Security Associates were being used as sacrificial pawns in this game between 32 Brass and Allied Barton, I also became kind of curious as to what exactly would happen with my people at Drexel. So when I began going back, when I was first taken off of the campaign at Drexel, I was assured by the union management, the brass of this campaign, that all my information, all my contacts, all my work would be handed off to another full-time organizer who would go in and basically pick up right where I left off. So after having been gone for about a period of, I'd say, two to maybe three weeks, I became, I decided to go back and see if I could find out what's been going on, if there'd been any uh, progress made with the people there. Only to discover from the contacts that I'd established that there really hadn't been anyone coming back around and that they were beginning to think that the union had just dropped them entirely. This set off the first of a series of alarm bells and this is also when I began sort of taking additional steps using the, the leadership as it was, the activist asset set that I'd built within this workplace to sort of train them up for worst case scenarios, training them about not just how... I did my job, but what the point and purpose and function of organizing a union was and how it was done, absent even a sort of parent union like SEIU. However, once it was discovered that I was beginning to take steps to protect the workers of both companies that I'd been organizing, well, I was replaced pretty quickly with another ditzy new grad who really wanted to save the world with her mass communications degree and good intentions. Well, I was also relatively certain it had been hired because Neil just wanted a fucker. You know, something apparently he was known for doing. But all the same, um, it was when this happened that I was shot back up to New Hampshire, sent off to Durham out on the coast, a rather affluent college area where UNH's main campus is located. And I was set to work with a small team of what you could tell were not exactly the cream of the crop organizers. These were good people, and they were good at their jobs, but they weren't exactly what SEIU wanted or liked. And so the three of us, without any leadership, without any support structure, without any information at all, we're just given the nebulous task of going out and uh, organizing what were called uh, PATs, Professional Administrative and Technical Staff. This, were, this could be anything from um, sort of like office workers or administrative officials to technical researchers. There was even a time in which I went to seek out a worker in one of these academic buildings only to discover that he was busy – Creating satellite components from scratch for a communication satellite that was to be launched into space. These were people who I would discover were making 50, 60, sometimes 100, sometimes I think in one case $200,000 a year. They had a state benefits plan, which was pretty well renowned as being the, one of the best benefit plans in the entire state of New Hampshire. And they were all together really happy with their job. They had a great relationship with their employer. And they were all just as curious as I was as to why the union, this being the State Employees Association, SEA 1984, why it was that we weren't actually going after the 
sanitation staff, the janitors, the the groundskeepers, the field staff, the people who were working for relatively lowish wages, who had benefits but who had their benefits potentially on a chopping block during a renegotiation um, with the state and the, between the state and the university. Why it was we weren't actually going to organize unions for the workers who genuinely needed them, and this was when it became apparent that in addition to the to the broader SEIU not really giving a shit about SEA and more instead just trying to mildly support this state employees union simply to keep the other state employees unions out of the area, that they were also going for dues money. It wasn't so much that they gave a shit about organizing and representing workers who needed things like standard contracts to assure that they had decent benefits or job security, but rather they wanted to go after workers with large enough salaries so that when the dues arrangements came through that they could assume that at least on a state level, they'd have a decent level of revenue to keep up all of their other operations. This campaign quite naturally fell apart very quickly and even more so when we finally got a senior organizer to come in and basically serve as a director of sorts. This man's name was Solis and he was very friendly but also pretty terrible at what it was he was doing with seemingly no real clue about how an organizing campaign should work. This being mostly made evident in the fact that what I'd say for the last month and a half, maybe two months worth of this campaign in which Solis took over... Uh, his focus was almost entirely on finding us a nice office to work out of, with him selecting one hotel workspace after another, having us decorate it and fix it up with this and that accoutrement before having to move on to another one, with very little actual focus being on organizing workers in any way or sorting out how to define the employees we were going after versus those that weren't within our jurisdiction. All in all, the campaign fell apart rather quickly, and um, there was a very there was well there wasn't much blame to go around. It was all in the brass's hands. But then the reality of this came true when, well, we were all offered um, well we were told that we could either take a small position with that particular local or that we would be uh, let go. In my case, uh, the day after the campaign went tits up, I was called by my new handler, a rather uh, br rather unpleasant woman, let's say, uh, to be informed that I was uh, just being let go. I was being fired. And when asked, uh, it was basically, it was just a, it was a no cause uh, firing, which is something that you're allowed to do in an at will state like New Hampshire. I was a bit pissed by this, you know, suffice it to say, especially because I had actually been trying to work my way back into Philadelphia, both to get back with my workers and also to restore the sort of life that I'd almost kind of built there. At the time, I had a pretty good stable of friends, uh, good social networks, had a girlfriend down there, and I just genuinely liked the city and wanted to get back. Now, Neil Diaz of 32BJ, once I was out of Philly, seemed to have a policy of not responding to emails or calls whatsoever. But this was curiously uh, flipped on its head about, I'd say, a month or two after my being fired. Now, upon my being fired, I almost immediately filed a grievance with the Union of Union Representatives, which I spoke about in a previous video about the oddball training in Potomac, Maryland. And I decided to become a member of that union at that time, realizing that if nothing more, that the fact that it needed to exist said that I'd probably need its help if I was going to continue working with this particular organization. And sure as shit, upon my firing, well, I filed a union grievance actually two weeks after. Now, the fun part being is that I first kind of got one over on SEIU because upon my firing, I asked, when will my final paycheck be provided? And they informed me that it would be within the normal two-week pay cycle. Now, I already knew, according to New Hampshire labor law, that when one was involuntarily terminated from a place of employment, the employer had 72 hours to furnish the final paycheck. Otherwise, each business day, up to 10 business days, which would follow from that 72-hour period expiring, would result in them owing said employee 10% of that final pay up into a total of 100% of that final check, which if not furnished in appropriate time fashion after that, would open them up to a lawsuit or arbitration, which would tend to favor the worker. I happen to know this. I was surprised that the union local didn't know this because I was allowed to give it two weeks and then ask for another check. That was pretty nice for severance.
But from there, I filed a grievance for the wrongful termination. That took quite a while, several months, I'd say, before there's any sort of resolution. And I could tell that I was not the only one doing this, as numbers of these OITs, who I've mentioned in the past, were just basically field hands hired on by SEIU to stat bulk up the numbers and staff numbers of their various campaigns without anybody have to spend a lot of money or dedicate themselves to actually maintaining that employee. Well... I was actually able to ultimately, through this grievance, get the OIT program first reformed and then, if I'm not mistaken, largely sort of taken down, at least in its previous incarnation. This was a program which throughout the union world was pretty notorious for being exploitative and abusive, with senior organizers routinely abusing their power to basically fuck younger organizers under their purview. This even being the case with one of my handlers, though I'm sure she'd deny it to Alan Back. But um, I could tell that I had him on the ropes, actually, because after all of this fighting, they said, well, if we give you your job back, would you be willing to drop this? To which I said, I flatly, no, there's no way in hell I or anybody else should trust you. So no, I'm going to carry this grievance through. Ultimately, they basically dismantled this uh, terrible program, thankfully, although I'm sure they've replaced it with something by now. But the final uh, and sort of straw, uh, the strike against SEIU, it came by way of the actual nature of the unionism that they had always been espousing. Now, beyond just abusing their own employees, beyond actually uh, succumbing to union grievances filed against them for being terrible fucking employers, there was also the nature of my workers in Philadelphia. Now, I mentioned that Neil Diaz there uh, never returned any calls. None of the Philly staff, senior staff, returned any calls or uh, emails or correspondence of any kind. I was persona non grata with 32 BJ at that point. Right up until a curious call came in from a Philadelphia number that I vaguely remembered. And it turned out that it was that same third shift worker who I'd met in that darkened alley and I actually set the task of uh, assembling, collecting, and collating the information about the company that would be needed for further organizing. I got a call from him asking where I'd been. Now keep in mind, this was a month or two after I'd been fired, which put it a good four, maybe five months uh, out from when my last day working on the Drexel campus had been. And he called me up to ask me where I'd been, how I'd been, but also where I'd been and why he hadn't seen or heard from me. I told him that I'd been fired months ago and that I'd been taken off the campaign months before that. But I asked him that I'd been given assurances upon my departure from Philadelphia that an organizer would be taking over my work and making sure that, the, that they got their majority and that they got their negotiation and their contract through. This turned out absolutely not to be the case. Instead, Neil and his buddies in the brass had decided to send a couple senior organizers and a couple uh, newbie rookies out, <clears throat> using what little information I'd given them before, to basically just start getting cards collected as their operations against Allied Barton continued, uh, continued on. This worker of mine called me up also because he was concerned as there was a rumor circulating throughout the Drexel Security Campus that a deal had been reached between 32BJ and Allied Barton in which 32 would be allowed to organize the unions and basically represent them in any further future negotiations in exchange for what Allied wanted, which was a sort of grace period in which they could clean house and fire any workers that they felt were troublesome. This namely being the workers who had been coming forward and stepping out and putting their necks on the line in the hopes of gaining the union and all of the benefits and, and negotiating power that was supposed to come with it. In effect, 32BJ was once again selling out workers so that its senior brass could pat themselves on the back for a job well done while securing a foothold in yet another city for the power base and dues collection that the union thrives upon. This employee was quite naturally worried about it and asked what it was that he should do, especially now that he didn't have any direct contact. He didn't have a guy with 32BJ. All he had was the organizers and senior organizers coming around to collect cards in preparation for this sweetheart grace period. And so I told him that in the same way that he'd helped organize meetings before, in the same way that he'd established networks of contacts throughout the campus and helped actually build what the union would have been, that he needed to organize an effort for everyone to go down to the Union Hall and take their cards and tear them up, to reject 32BJ entirely. 
he was naturally a little nervous about this, saying, well, what do we do then? At which point I pretty much was pretty happy to tell him, just do what it was that we taught you. The job of a good organizer, not an organizer that the union might like, but a good organizer, is to organize and train the people who they're going after effectively enough to the point where that if they weren't there to help them, that they could do it themselves. It's a common joke that a, that a union organizer's job, fundamentally, the end goal of it is to organize yourself out of work. The idea being that once the workers were able to organize themselves, there'd be no further need for us. This was sort of a brief conversation between he and I, and I really implored him, reject SEIU. Like, let the word go as far and wide as it can be. SEIU is bad for workers. And this is a sentiment that I stand by even today, even having some friends who are still union members, who still love their locals. And if they work for them, that is great. But in general, SEIU, much like organizations like AFSME, a more predatory, self-interested organizations where people of ambition and low character can oftentimes rise to the top simply by virtue of them kissing the right ass and brokering the right shitty deals. But all the same, imploring them to leave SEIU behind, it was about two days later, I want to say, that none other than Neil Diaz himself called me directly after months of radio silence, demanding that I turn over any remaining records and contact information from the guards at Drexel to him so that they could see to it that they got the union and the contract that they deserved. Uh, suffice it to say, I wasn't too keen on really uh, helping Neil out at this point, especially not too keen in helping out a union local, which had a track record of fucking workers over. And it actually tried to use me in a plan to fuck other workers over. So I asked him a little bit, just saying, well, oh, it's kind of funny, you know, you don't call, you don't write. Now all of a sudden you call me up because you need some. First he tries to rattle my cage, telling me that I, I, I had to give it to him because it was part of their operations. When it became clear that I wasn't falling for that shit, he began trying to play to my unionist sympathy, saying, well, you don't think they deserve a union? You don't think they deserve a contract? Now, memory serves the last thing I said to Neil before hanging up on him was, oh, they absolutely deserve a union. They just deserve one that's better than you. And I hung up the phone. This wasn't quite the end of it, though. In fact, this sort of happy ending which came about as a result of this came even months later when I stumbled across a news item from Labor Notes. Um, I believe his name was Ernesto Castillo or something. All the same, the journalist had written a story about how the allied Barton guards at, I believe it was U Penn or Temple, had rejected SEIU and 32BJ in favor of forming their own shop union. Now, if I'm still speaking Greek moon man talk to you about this, let me just break it down real quick. In order for a union to actually form, a given workplace, a defined workplace or employee base, needs to have a majority of those workers sign cards and file cards with, a, with either themselves or with the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB or the Labor Relations Board of their state, to demonstrate that their workplace has established a majority who desires to establish a bargaining unit. That's like the sort of official name of what the union actually is. It's a body of employees which is recognized lawfully by the labor department itself and hopefully by the company, which that comes afterwards, but allows them to enter negotiations for contracts and things regarding benefits, pay, job security, standards and practices and these sorts of things. And it's not a one-way street either. Oftentimes, a lot of people who actually form up unions initially are worried about that classic cliche of the union protecting shitty workers and letting shitty people get away with things. Well, this is where the organizing and the actual negotiating teams really come into play. In a shop union, everything is done in-house. The organizers are the workers themselves. The workers come together and organize themselves into bargaining units. It's a much more difficult thing to do, but in the long run, typically ends up being more efficient and better overall when it comes to the negotiations. The other side to it is if you have a local such as 32BJ in this case do it, well, oftentimes the negotiating team will be a mix of representatives from the local office itself as well as the employees who've been sort of selected or elected through the union to take on that responsibility. But there I was looking at this article, feeling just so very happy to see Allied Barton Guards not only building, forming, filing, and creating their own union, but doing so in a way which flagrantly rejected the toxic sort of bullshit 
of the 32BJ local and SEIU as a whole, even rejecting the purple and gold colors of SEIU in favor of a blue and white motif. Looking at the pictures of these particular guards, pleased with their own union, pleased with the fact that they were going to go into a negotiation or a, a rec well a recognition fight, and that's when your majority is recognized by the state. But if your employer refuses to recognize you, well, then you have to start taking steps such as work stoppages, walkouts, or anything from you know small demonstrations upwards of even strikes to force the company to recognize your majority and acknowledge your union and agree to come to a negotiating table. Well, to see them taking those first steps in spite of not only a company which fights tooth and nail and sometimes spends thousands upon thousands of dollars to keep this from happening, but also in spite of the dirty, shitty, shady actions of a union who looked really to exploit them even more than their own employers did, it did definitely fill me with a sense of... Hmm, I guess you could almost call it justice. After that, I've never really looked back on the labor world. I've attempted to actually get jobs with other union organizations here or there, but remembering the bitter taste that SEIU left when I was um, well manipulated out of a job as it was, what did make me feel pretty good? To know that maybe, just maybe, there was a future for organized labor that didn't rely on what was effectively big box, big labor stores like Wal like Walmart, like SEIU or AFSCME or the AFL-CIO. That maybe the future of labor didn't rest with grand multi-million dollar campaigns waged by wide-eyed do-gooders, many of whom themselves have never worked an actual day in their lives, but actually getting back to the roots of it with the workers themselves organizing according to their own principles, with shop unions stepping forward and creating bargaining units which would focus not on generating dues or power for a broader union organization, but to allow them to actually bring their collective concerns, desires, and, and affairs directly to the employer for a, a fair negotiation across the table. Maybe there would be hope for the American labor movement after all. <laughs> leaving aside people like Comrade Starbucks, who would like to say that they speak for it. All the same, it did leave me somewhat hopeful. Now, I said this before, but I think I'll just end this series as it was, leave it off with this. Despite my criticisms of organizations like SEIU or AFSCME, or certain locals within the AFL-CIO, or any of these <clears throat> big labor organizations, I remain a unionist. I genuinely do believe that companies themselves can work best when the workers have some form of a voice in what goes on, when they're not just seen as chattel or another part of the bottom line, but actually regarded as a valued and, and, and respectable piece of this company by senior management. And this isn't to paint all managers or all corporations as soulless entities, although we do know that when it comes to things such as Amazon or perhaps... Uh, Walmart or the like, there's a great deal of that. But all the same, I do believe that when, especially a shop union, a union with a focus not so much on grand political aspirations or supporting candidates or running outside uh, campaign operations using dues money and focusing on what kind of dues money they can squeeze out of places like universities, that when these unions focus on actually fighting for what it is that the workers themselves need and want, it causes those same workers to feel even more invested in their jobs and in their companies, feeling as though they're respected there, feeling as though that their efforts are fruitful, not simply for a board of shareholders, but for themselves and for their colleagues. I believe that unionism is a good thing, and I believe, like so many other things, with great potential to be wonderful. It's been more corrupted by the corruptible influences of power structures, such as those which evolve within big box union locals, such as 32BJ. I hope to see a revival of a true American labor movement, one focused more on workers and less on politics, and I hope to see it soon, because I am still a unionist in spite of these well, actually, not even. I'm still a unionist, not in spite of these controversies and these condemnations of mine, but because of it. Because I still believe that the workforces of the United States deserve a voice in their workplaces, and I believe that they deserve one that is absent 
of the corruptive and corrosive influences of self-interested parties such as bigwig union brass. So that's been my series on my union experiences. I hope you found these somewhat interesting, informative, however it might be. I'm curious to know, do you yourself have any uh, experiences with unions, good or bad or weird or otherwise? Let me know down in the comments. Let me know if you got any questions, of course. In the course of doing so, feel free to like this video, share it around to people you think might find it interesting. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and maybe the bell. It would be nice to see some growth on this channel again, but all the same. Those of you who keep coming back, I love you to death. Thank you. This work wouldn't exist without you. And if you're so interested in supporting the work I do here, be it these sort of stories from these odd fields, be it different political insights, which hopefully I'm, I'm hoping to really make uh, something other than this culture war bullshit that seems to be dominating everyone's conversations, or if you enjoy the readings of the classic literature that I do, or anything else I do here, Feel free to visit the links down below. Consider becoming a patron. Support the channel. Support the work I do. Keep the lights on. Keep some food in my belly. It's always a good thing. Short of that, though, I thank you for laboring through these videos with me. Again, I hope you found them interesting or entertaining in some fashion, and I look forward to hearing from you in, uh, down below in the comments. Additionally, in the pinned comment, you should find a small poll three different topics. Give a thumbs up to the one you want to see me do next, and let me know in the comments below that why you want to see them, what you're hoping to hear. All the same, this has been the Union series. It's finally done. Finally got it done. Thank God. And I hope you enjoyed, and I thank you for sticking around, and I'll see you next time. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster, and treat those two imposters just the same,